The Master Liquid ML360R RGB is a new all-in-one by Cooler Master that sports a 360mm radiator, addressable RGB fans, and a low-profile dual-chamber pump. The nicely sleeved FEP tubing has a premium feel, and you can use the included RGB control unit to customize the addressable LEDs on the fans and pump, or plug directly into your motherboard. For more on the Master Liquid ML360R RGB, click the sponsor link in the video's description. What's up guys, how's it going? Welcome back to Paul's Hardware. This is Probing Paul, episode number 29. This is my monthly Q&A video where people ask me questions about technology or other random stuff and I answer those questions. And I've been doing this for, I guess this is the 29th episode, so that many episodes. Here's a look at the cornhole of history or whatever you wanna call it going, look how tiny they get back there. But uh, if you guys wanna look at other questions I've answered, then feel free to check out my old Probing Pauls. There is a playlist. Now in episode 28, I actually asked a question, which is about background music in videos such as this, where I'm just kind of talking at you guys for a little while. And the response was pretty overwhelming actually, and uh, actually eye-opening for me. People don't like the music. They said it's distracting if I'm just talking. So I am going to take that to heart. It does take more effort to put the background music in there and I will leave it out of this type of video from now on. Except maybe for some quick music for an intro or an outro. I got uh, quite a few comments actually in the comments from the last video too, such as Vitor Liel's uh, just following up and saying yes, he actually prefers videos without background music. Um, so cool, I'm gonna stick with that. Also wanted to point out some additional feedback I got from last month, which is about my audio. And my audio is something that I do try to keep an eye on, not an eye, an ear, I guess, but um, Rem pointed out and several other people have pointed out that you can hear my dog, Hero. He's snoring in the background. So actually for today, I'm going with a different audio setup. I'm using my lav mic, which has proven to be a little bit better of a solution out here in the garage, especially when it's really hot and I have to run the air conditioner. Or of course, if Hero is in here and he's snoring or breathing loudly, which he is doing right now. He's a hundred pound Italian Mastiff mix and he can get a little noisy sometimes. So let me know. I actually have him in here right now and he is breathing. Let me know if you can hear it or if it's better or worse than uh, in the past videos when I've used this mic. This is actually a condenser mic and it's a good mic, but it's not made for a scenario like I'm in right now where there's potentially other noise that it could pick up on because it does do that. So for today, I'm sticking with a lav mic and again, let me know uh, what you guys think if the audio is better this way and of course how much you can hear heroes breathing in the background one more question uh, related to last month's video which is about the 140 millimeter fans versus 120 millimeter fans and this was just a little bit of math that i didn't quite point out lots of people said it's 20 millimeters bigger of course 120 to 140 but with 120 and 140 you're talking about the side of the fan measurements and of course you have to multiply both sides in order to get the total area of the fan and William's just pointing out here that 140 millimeter squared is a lot bigger than 120 millimeter squared. 120 times 120 is about 14,400. 140 times 140 is about 19,600 square millimeters. So 35% more area, and that means it can move more air and be quieter and all that good stuff. Moving on, the next question here is from Niall Pierce, and he says, hey Paul, any chance you can do a tutorial video on clean Windows installs or moving your installed operating system over to a different storage drive? Uh, Niall, I actually have several videos on this topic specifically, or at least setting up a new PC. My most recent one is uh, maybe two, two and a half months ago. Uh, so I'll link that in the video description if you wanna check it out. That's taking you from the, I just built a new computer to getting Windows onto a USB drive and plugging that USB drive in and installing Windows onto the system and getting it set up for the first time, which isn't always covered in my my build videos, but you're talking about migrating an operating system from an existing computer over to a new computer, and you might notice that I almost never do that, and there's specific reasons, mainly due to my past experience with PC building and attempting to migrate operating systems over. It's mainly a peace of mind thing for me, but there are potential issues that can go on when you're taking an operating system and moving it from one system to another with completely different hardware. Since Windows 7, it has gotten a lot better, so it is something that you are possibly able to do. The reason I don't do tutorials is because everyone's situation is a little bit different, so I couldn't necessarily address the potential problems that you might have versus someone else who's migrating from a completely different system. The easiest, the simplest way, the most confident way that you can be sure that your new system is getting the maximum amount of performance is just to do a clean install. If you're moving from an old system to a new system and you're doing a clean install, there's a pretty short list of things that you can make sure you do to get everything from your old system onto your new system. Uh, the first is of course to check my documents and hopefully you have a repository where you've been saving everything, personal files and everything. Usually that's my documents. So 
Back that up to an external drive, back everywhere else that you might have saved files to an external drive, go into your installed programs list and write down the names of all the programs that you have installed that you use regularly. And I also like to go into my browsers like Chrome or Firefox, and if you have a bunch of shortcuts or bookmarks, you can actually back those up and save them. Fortunately, like with Chrome, if you log in with your Chrome ID, it will save those to the cloud now, so you don't necessarily need to do that step, but if you're not logging in with a cloud account, then that's something you should probably do as well. Ultimately though, I just recommend the clean install because it's the way you will be ensured that your system is going to be operating at peak efficiency, that you don't have any old clutter from your old system that might be bogging things down and causing the system to take way too long to start up or anything like that. And finally, if you're familiar and comfortable with a clean system install and a reformat of your system, if you ever have issues in the future like getting a virus or something like that, it's the easiest way to remove that. I've got all my stuff backed up elsewhere, wipe the drive, reformat, reinstall, virus is gone in like 99.9% .9 of scenarios. So hopefully that helps you out. And again, check that how to set up a new PC video if you want a step-by-step -step guide. Next question from Silva Rides. He says, given that plenty of people are already buying two 1080 Ti's at the time, is the price of 2080s really that crazy? And I think he's talking about 2080 Ti's. Don't get me wrong, it's all crazy, but people were already spending that much money. Clearly they had no problems buying them up as soon as the 2080s came out. So maybe Nvidia knows exactly what they're doing. I think this is worth taking another look at. And so if I apologize if you get any hate in the comments from people who are like, no, they're price gouging us and we deserve to be able to buy 2080 Ti's for 800 bucks or whatever you personally feel these cards should sell for. When I think about the 2080 Ti pricing though, what comes to mind most often is the Titan. And the Titan was launched back in 2013, I think, the first version of it. And it was $1,000 at the time when the most expensive graphics cards were selling for five or 600 bucks each. Now there are differences between the launches. The Titan was launched as a bridge to the workstation market. So you could use it for gaming, but they were like, no, this is actually for workstation stuff. But then of course it went into a bunch of high-end gaming systems. Whereas the 2080 Ti is very much, this is a consumer graphics card that we're expecting people to spend $1,200 on. The reason I relate this to the Titan is because I know the Titan sold. For as much of an elite, out of most people's price range product that it was, it still sold regularly, and it sold for $1,000 to the point where they felt comfortable releasing other Titans that cost even more than that when it came to like the Titan XP. So if you wanna look at it from Nvidia's perspective and give them the best possible benefit of the doubt that you can, then you can say, well, they're making a business's decision to sell these cards at a certain price they know they can get that much money for it, and they know there are enough people who will pay that much to make it worth their while, despite all the other people who can usually only afford cards that are maybe three or 400 bucks, complaining that this product is elite and outside the price range of most people. That said though, if there is frustration being directed at Nvidia that is perfectly legitimate right now, I think it comes down to this. Moore's Law is slowing down. We're not able to get the constant increases in performance, both for CPUs and with GPUs, that we were a little bit spoiled with in like, say, the 90s and 2000s. So if you look at the past 20 years or so, every few years, you could probably buy a new component, a new GPU, a new CPU for the same price as you spent a couple years back and get a pretty solid boost in performance, 10, 20, 30, 40% sometimes. Whereas now, the performance improvements, they're just charging more money for. And again, from Nvidia's perspective, that makes total sense because they're a business and they need to make as much money as possible and there's no competition. From our perspective, that sucks because we have been accustomed to being able to spend the same amount of money a few years later and get more performance. Now it's a few years later and we have to spend more money for more performance. And of course that pisses people off who are used to the old style. I like the old style better too. I agree that these cards are very overpriced, but as long as people keep buying them, Nvidia is gonna keep selling them for that price. And it's not really gonna matter how many people complain that they can't afford it as long as other people are actually buying it. So that's how it's gonna go until AMD comes out with something that's competitive. I hope that happens soon. Next question from Trogaholic. Hey Paul, is the length of a cable ever a bottleneck for gaming? Uh, E.g. if I get 90 frames per second with my two meter HDMI cable, if I were to get a five meter or longer one, would I see any noticeable changes? I'm gonna address your question in two ways. First of all, when it comes to HDMI, when you're talking about a digital signal, it's a yes or no game. There's nothing like with an analog signal where it degrades and then you get limited performance or not as many frames per second. If it's not working, it's not gonna work. This does mean to answer your question, two meters, five meters, no difference. It's not gonna affect your frame rate or anything like that. The larger question is how long can an HDMI cable be? And it 
turns out there is an answer to that question. Uh, I'll link this article. It's from 2011, but still perfectly viable today about extending HDMI cables. It's from Popular Mechanics. It goes into a little bit more of the details for that, but 50 feet is the short answer, is the maximum length that an HDMI cable can be and reliably still provide a signal. You'll find that if you look at HDMI cables, you probably will have a hard time finding anything longer than 25 feet, and that's simply because People don't often need anything more than 25 feet, and manufacturers don't have to worry about those situations where the source isn't able to actually send the signal that far, which can happen in certain situations. Now, I have a couple products I wanted to show you guys that are related to this, but I need to make a huge disclaimer first that my wife works for Monoprice, so please don't accept this as a full-throated endorsement of Monoprice or anything like that. I'm basically referring you to the fact that these products exist, and when it comes to something like an HDMI signal, you actually have multiple choices for how to extend that signal longer if you so desire or need to. And one of the cool ways to do it is actually to take the HDMI and feed it into a CAT6 cable, and there you can go runs, at least according to these products, of up to 164 feet. So it's got a main unit here uh, that you feed power to, and then you feed your HDMI signal into, and then it's got four CAT6 outs where you can take CAT6 cable and then route those over to these smaller units CAT6 go into this, goes into the smaller unit, it's got an HDMI out, and then you plug that into your display. And again, guys, I'm only bringing this up because it's something that exists. And when it comes to HDMI signals, if you want to take a source and then feed it to somewhere very far away, this is just something that I was aware of that um, not everyone might be. But again, just to be fully clear, my wife works for Monoprice, so I want to disclose that before I talk about any of their products. Anytime I talk about any, any of their products. Moving on though, I have a couple questions from Twitter. This is from Rob at that mailing guy. He said, an impromptu probing of Paul Hardware. I, I don't think he even knew that I was about to do this Q&A video. He says he's recently upgraded to a 1070 Ti. He's looking for a new monitor. There's many options, and uh, he wants my suggestions for a budget of $400 to $550. Bigger the better, of course. So I would want to maximize your PC gaming advantages, say, over consoles. And I'm not saying consoles are bad. If you want to game it on a console, that's fine. But there are things that you can say, this is what PC gaming is better at. One of those is higher resolution. You don't want to go 4K, because it'd be hard to push that with a 1070 Ti. So 2560 by 1440, I think, is your bread and butter range. And then beyond that, you want G-Sync, because adaptive frame rate is one of the very nice things, again, that PC gaming can do that you can't necessarily get on the consoles. So looking at those two parameters, 2560 by 1440 and uh, G-Sync, and I'm just looking at Newegg for all of the monitors they have. I'm only looking at what Newegg sells because I don't like Newegg Marketplace sellers, but here we can see we've got an Acer, an AOC, uh, we've also got Asus models here that are within the $500 to $600 range. So this might be just ever so slightly out of the $550 max that you pointed out, but I would definitely say it's worth it to try to, to, try to creep up, you know, if it's just just a matter of another 15 or 20 bucks. This is a 27 inch monitor, so it's a very nice size. 2560 by 1440 is your resolution, and then also high refresh rate. This is 144 hertz refresh rate, and you can overclock it potentially to 165 hertz. There's also an Asus ROG Swift version for about 600 bucks. These are TN panels, so they're not gonna be quite the level of color depth, but honestly for gaming, I think the resolution, the refresh rate, and then of course G-Sync is gonna be a better bet. Uh, and then I also went and just did a similar search here over here on PC Part Picker to try to get a, a bit wider range of potential stores. And here, uh, you can actually see there's some 24 inch versions you can get for about 400 bucks. I'd recommend $500, and for $500, you can get this one right here, the Acer Predator XB1, the same one we were looking at just a second ago that's about $565 on Newegg. And it's actually available on Amazon and Newegg Business for $500. Look at that. So this Acer Predator is what I would get right now, just if I was shopping right now and needed to buy something right now. But again, uh, double check, reality check, take those parameters, 2560 by 1440, G-Sync support, plug them in, uh, and then when it comes to brands, Acer is a great choice, Asus is a great choice, uh, Dell has some great options out there too. I saw an LG in there as well, um, I've never had a problem with them either, so uh, hopefully that will help you out. And one last question here, this one's a little bit more random from Michael C. He asks, Paul, have you been losing weight? Um, no? Wait, hold on a sec. Okay, I literally just went and weighed myself because I had no idea and I haven't weighed myself in a while. No, Michael. I have not lost weight, but um, I'm somewhat flattered that you thought I did, and I will hopefully use this as motivation to continue exercising and eating lots of fruits and vegetables. But gosh, the holiday season is upon us, so that might be challenging. I'll do my best. Thank you for your question, Michael, and thank you guys all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, hit the thumbs up button, and of course, leave me a question in the comments section down below if you want me to potentially answer it in next month's Probing Paul. Thanks again for watching, guys, and we'll see you next time.